Welcome to the first 2015 webinar sponsored by the Workflow 4.0 e-newsletter and ClearEdge 3D. Our webinar topic today is dot product to edgewise to Revit, a revolutionary workflow. Hi, my name is Kevin Corbley and I'll be your moderator today. I'm the editor-in-chief of Workflow 4.0, the newsletter of 3D scanning, modeling, documentation, ideas, and opinions. First, let me start by thanking you, our attendees, for joining us today. With over 650 registrants, this is one of the most popular webinars we've presented, and the topic is obviously a good one. As you probably know, handheld scanners are gaining in popularity for reality capture, and this webinar will explore the workflow benefits that are realized when you combine a robust handheld like the DOT product DPI-7 with the automated modeling technology and Revit integration of Edgewise. And you'll get the full story on that in just a minute. Let's take a quick look at today's agenda. We have a packed schedule today with professionals representing several perspectives in the scanning and modeling profession. First, we'll hear about the DOT product DPI-7 and Edgewise products and how they're integrated in a workflow. Then we'll have two DPI to Edgewise to Revit workflow case studies, one involving a chiller piping room and the second in an electrical room. And then, of course, our experts will take questions from the attendees, as we always do. Let me go through a couple of quick housekeeping measures here. Um, <clears throat> everyone in the audience is muted during the session, except for the presenters, obviously. And feel free to ask questions uh, via the question window during the session. Um, however, most questions will be taken during the Q&A session at the end, but you can send them in to us at any time. Uh, and this webinar is being recorded, by the way, and you'll receive a link uh, afterwards uh, showing you where you can, uh, can look at it again or send it along to a colleague. And we also ask that you subscribe to Workflow 4.0, and that's the e-newsletter for learning as well as sharing experiences, opinions, and best practices. And let me make a few introductions here. As you see, we have uh, quite a panel today. Um, Greg Laws is the uh, principal at Point 3D Inc. of Cherry Hill, Pennsylvania, and his firm offers consulting, product sales, and training. And we've also got Jeffrey McDonald, who's an advisor with Inceptia in Texas. Jeffrey works out of the San Antonio office, and he has over 25 years in the digital uh, design industry. And uh, Sean Hescock is the pr principal at Indivirev in Portland, Oregon. He's an expert in Revit, MEP, and many other packages and technologies. And many of you already know our own Kevin Williams. He's the chief scientist and founder at ClearEdge 3D in Northern Virginia. And not pictured here, but joining us for Q&A will be Tom Greaves. He's the VP of Marketing for Dot Product, and he'll be able to field any questions uh, that you may have about the, uh, the DPI-7. Gentlemen, we're happy to have you with us today. And let's take a quick look at today's goals. We like our webinar attendees to walk away having learned something they didn't know before, and today will be no different. You'll learn the following. We're going to talk about the types of projects that are ideal for handheld scanners, and we're also going to review some practical handheld collect, uh, collection tips to ensure fast and accurate field work. And you'll learn how Dot Product and ClearEdge 3D have integrated their software to offer users a seamless workflow from scan to Revit. And of course, we're going to tell you about the potential savings this inexpensive and fast workflow could deliver for your next project. All right, uh, let me bring on Greg Laws of Point 3D and Kevin Williams of ClearEdge 3D to uh, introduce the products today. Greg, take it away for us. Thank you, Kevin. I am pleased to be here today talking to hopefully a very enthusiastic audience. First, a little bit about the companies. Thank you for the introduction on Point 3D. We are both a dot product and a clear edge partner, and I'm very excited about the integration, the close integration between these two products. A little bit about dot product. Dot product was founded by visionaries and experts in the computer vision, plant design, and laser scanning worlds and saw a need that has developed into this amazing system, the DPI-7. What is the system? 
the system is comprised of a number of components. The sensor, a prime sense sensor, much like found in gaming systems, an Android tablet, and what really brings and makes this a powerful tool is the computer vision magic, the software application that brings this all together. Some points about the instrument. I mentioned gaming sensors, but this instrument is calibrated and accurate. We are capturing engineering grade information that you can use in your designs, construction, validation, a wide range of applications. It's a handheld instrument. So for the folks in our audience who are used to tripod and other type systems, a lot lighter, a lot simpler, a lot easier to use. With the current sensor, data collection is meant for interior work, indoor collection. There are sensors in the future that will address a wider range of scenes. And collecting scenes, the instrument, the sensor can collect from two feet out to 11 feet from a single position. And it's fast and instant feedback. Fast, typical scenes are captured in two to five minutes. A little post-processing on the tablet, hook it up to a laptop, and we're ready for easy export to formats that you're used to, PTX, PTS point formats, a PLY mesh format, and then very excited, there's a number of partners who have direct integration with the dot product format, the binary DP, the Autodesk recap application, LFM server, Trimble Rework, RealWorks, Cloud Compare, Faro seen and very excited about the ClearEdge Edgewise integration. What I'd like to do is take a flip the screen over. We're going to take a quick look at a short video on the instrument, how it works. And hopefully you're looking at my screen. We're looking at a video titled Mechanical Room. This is the type space that is ideally suited for this instrument data collection. We're looking at an MEP space. We're looking at piping and equipment. We're looking at a scene that's rich in features. We've turned the instrument on and we're now instantaneously starting to capture information. What you're seeing on the scene is the feedback that you get as you capture. We see the scene, we see yellow and green, which tells us that we are getting good data collection. We treat this instrument much like a video camera in that we pan around the scene and we capture through that panning what we intend to see. We're almost painting the scene, if you will. The red bar on the left is an indication of how much data I'm collecting and when I've hit the limit or what I'm interested in seeing, I hit stop, a quick post process, and we're now looking at the data, the point cloud that we captured. It's really that quick. If we could flip back over, and we're going to talk about the people that are using this data. Where is this instrument? This instrument has been on the market for about two years now, and it's in a wide range of companies from engineering, construction, construction management companies. These are names that you know, recognize, trust used in a range of applications from preliminary data collection at the beginning of a project where we are trying to get information on perhaps a po proposed piping configuration. Others are using it for change management during a project. We encounter something we didn't expect, grab that instrument, go out to the field and collect that data. As we start to construct, the instrument is used by others for validation to make sure that that pipe spool was fabricated correctly. And at the end of the project, we have others that are even using this for as, as is documentation so that we can, before we close up the wall, take a shot and show what's behind the wall. That's the magic of the system, and these are some of the folks that are using it. For those interested in taking a look firsthand at the instrument, we are having an open house in Houston next week, February 6th and you'll be able to come and try out the instrument in a almost real world setting at the Eaton Technology Center down in Houston. Kevin, back to you, thank you. All right, Kevin. All right. 
Go well, this, ahead. Um, <laughs> okay, got a little mixed up with the two Kevins there. Thank you. Um, so I want to talk just a little bit about Edgewise. Um, the, in this whole workflow from dot .product to uh, ultimately ending up inside of Revit, Edgewise is sitting kind of in the middle as um, almost like a Rosetta Stone. It's, it's a translation application that goes from the, this wonderfully rich point cloud data that comes out of the dot .product scanner into an intelligent, fully functional Revit model. Um, and being able to do that efficiently is 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 key. Um, so Edgewise, kind of the core technology behind the Edgewise software is automated feature extraction. Um, that and object recognition. Um, and those those enable you to very quickly take this this data that comes out of this this dot product scanner and convert it into intelligent models, um, piping, steel, ducting, etc. Um, and we found that this, this automated technology it typically results in pretty big time savings, um, often up to 70% for, you know, depending on the, the project and what you're trying to model. Um, the newest version of our software will be completely integrated with the DPI-7 um, to, to give you a very seamless workflow. So the Current, current version right now, um, we, we can read their PTX files, but the, the next one will take the DP file format and read it directly, and um, we're, we're really quite excited about that. So that'll shave off even more time on the whole, whole process. Um, and then, of course, the, the software has, has deep integration with Revit. So everything, everything that is built inside of Edgewise um, falls seamlessly into, into Revit as, as if it had been built inside of Revit, just a whole lot easier to, to construct the model. So a, a real quick overview of the different capabilities, the different products within the, the Edgewise family. Um, Edgewise Plant has the, the capability to model out everything within a pipeline, all the valves, flanges. It uses um, standards, it, different international standards, um, and associates the, the, the intelligence behind those, those whatever standards you chose to the pipeline. So you can have a 300-pound line, and it'll size all the valves and flanges accordingly. Um, Edgewise MEP is built specifically for Revit. Um, and includes all of the, the, the functionality for getting out um, piping, uh, conduit, and ducting. And the, the latest version includes square ducting and some pretty cool functionality in there for, for modeling really intricate you know, transitions and elbows and everything like that inside of square ducting. And then bringing it all of across as a fully functional connected um, system within Revit. Edgewise building, again, is, is re very focused on the Revit side of things. Um, it enables you to go through and extract walls and uh, windows, basically create a, a, a floor plan very, very quickly from a point cloud. And then finally, Edgewise structure. Um, this has the capability to go through and very quickly extract out steel, um, concrete, and wood components um, and bring those into Revit or, or AutoCAD or MicroStation um, with all of the geometry and all of the, the intelligence intact. All right, so we're, we're really quite excited about an upcoming release. It's a major release for us. Um, Edgewise 4.6 is coming out in about a, a month. And this will have uh, one of the biggies is Plant 3D integration. So before we've been, our, our plant application has gone into CADWorks and PDMS, and we're really quite excited. We've been working closely with the Autodesk team to get our, all of the intelligence and all of the pipe networks into Plant 3D. Um, we've also significantly improved our, our Revit integration. Um, what before, one of the, the uh, issues that, that we would run across was just the finickiness that Revit has with different angled elbows. Um, if it's if it's significantly over 90 degrees, Revit um, would would fail to import them. Um, but our our team was able to 
figure out some workarounds over the last several months and and get that working so that all of the elbows now now import directly, um, which is which is a big big deal. Uh, there's a little bit of a pain to go back through and find all the missing elbows, and that that issue is solved. We've also solved some um, some issues with minor discrepancies in the diameters of the elbows, things like that. Um, so it's a it's a very clean, very direct. Um, workflow now to, to get a pipe network into to Revit. So that's a that's a big improvement. We've also uh, one of the things we're most excited about is we've we've gone back and improved the pipe extraction algorithms um, to where we now get very very clean very very good results um, and almost completely eliminate all of the false hits. Um, so before one of our, our bugaboos was was corrugated steel. Uh, we would, yeah, because the the corrugation pattern fits fits a cylinder very closely. We would often extract just row after row after row on corrugated walls of pipes. Um, all of that's 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 um, been taken care of in this these new algorithms. They're a lot smarter um, and enable us to to um, almost skip the QC step. Um, we're, we're debating whether we even recommend that even more anymore. Um, because the the output is so clean, and then finally we've made some some big improvements to the navigation and uh, experience of the software. So the the navigating through the point cloud is a whole lot more responsive. Um, we've got a, a nice new easy to use clipping box that enables you to to really quickly get down to just the points that you're interested in, um, etc. So there's there's a lot. A lot of big, major changes coming out in this next release, and uh, I'm I'm looking forward to it. Okay, great, Kevin Williams. Appreciate that, Greg Laws. Appreciate your insights as well. And uh, before I bring on um, our next speaker, who's Jeffrey McDonald, I just want to remind uh, the audience that um, you can go ahead and start sending us your um, questions now. And uh, we will get to those right at the end. And now I'm going to ask Jeffrey McDonald to come on. And uh, Jeffrey, I'm going to hand over control to you, and you can take us through your presentation. OK, great, Kevin. Thank you very much. As Kevin mentioned, uh, my name is Jeffrey McDonald, and I work with Inceptia. We, uh, let me tell you a little bit about our company first. I work for a company called Inceptia. We are headquartered out of Texas. Uh, we are an Autodesk reseller, but we do provide solutions across North America. Uh, we've been um, very involved in the uh, fabrication solutions that are specific to the MEP contractors. and We uh, were involved with many people across the country, and we actually do services up in as, as far as Canada as well. Uh, Inceptia is a company that's been around for 27 years, uh, winning awards with service and technology. Uh, as I mentioned, we are deeply invested in, in what Autodesk calls the advanced MEP or the fabrication sector. So all of the customers that we work with are working on the fabrication side, so post-design. Uh, the world that we live in is a level 400, level 450 type uh, environment, so we're working with very exacting dimensions. Uh, Inceptia provides solutions uh, ranging from design, AutoCAD and Revit, through to fabrication, uh, construction, as well as all the way through to commissioning. And uh, where we excel really is, is bringing technology together, integrating different types of technologies, just like these that we're seeing today, to solve uh, complex process and workflow needs for our customers. So this, uh, this case, study, case study here is, is uh, is really was a started off as a as an example. I I'd spoken to a customer about the, these technologies, and, and they said, "Why don't you come in and show us what you can do with it?" So uh, the involvement of Inception on this project was was really just to come in and and do it a, a, an example or, or show the demonstrate the different technologies that were being used here. Um, this was actually my first uh, opportunity to use these technologies together. So um, I don't want you to think that it took me several uh, several opportunities or several practice runs to get this done. Um, there was a little bit of work um, pulling the the files together, but most of that was a learning process on on my part. Um, 
So what, what this is, is a chiller room in Oregon. And where we saw the need for this, uh, if I back up a little bit here, I, I, saw, the, uh, I saw Tom and met, met Tom and Kevin at a, a customer technology show a year ago. And when I saw the two technologies, the first thing I thought of right away was our customers and, and doing as-builts for mechanical rooms. I, I've spoken to many of our customers and uh, they simply smile uh, when you ask them about uh, talking to their customers about having as-builts when they approach a project. Uh, they typically don't exist. If they do exist, they're uh, uh, older two-dimensional drawings uh, that typically have not been kept up to date. They certainly are not uh, anything that would provide uh, three-dimensional knowledge of being able to go in and, and do retrofit or rework uh, that our customers typically are doing. So right away I was excited about uh, the opportunity that, that these technologies could provide. So um, where our customers live whenever we, uh, you know, we, we are a software reseller and, and we provide solutions and whenever we start our, our software demonstrations we always start with something called a basis of design. Uh, typically for us, the basis of design is our customers tracing over either a PDF that's been provided or tracing over an AutoCAD drawing, uh, possibly working with a Revit file. Our, our products will actually pull Revit files in automatically. Um, but if you don't have those items and all you have is an existing space to deal with, that's where this technology comes into play. So what I've been able to develop here is a basis of design uh, very quickly. And the goal here was, of course, to integrate these new technologies, uh, trying to deliver fast, inexpensive uh, models, again, for our customers to, to begin with as they start working through the process. So uh, I, I kind of gave myself this challenge, and, and it's like many things in life. Uh, certainly, we talked about these things at the beginning of the new year with New Year's resolutions. If you want to stick to something, just start telling everybody you've got this idea and this goal, and pretty soon you find that, uh, find that you really have to kind of get it done. So my goal was to have a four-hour process of starting from the morning at 8 a.m. at the customer site, uh, completing the scans, taking those scans into uh, recap and getting them cleaned up, at the same time taking them uh, through the PTX format into the Edgewise software. And by the end of the day or by the end of that four-hour time by noon, I would basically have my point cloud and the Edgewise model uh, pipe resolution into my AutoCAD, which is my design environment. Um, just to note, I know that this webinar is typically are titled, uh, uh, you know, moving into Revit. Uh, most of our customers that we work with, because of the primary tools that we use, they are still in AutoCAD. Uh, Autodesk is moving into the Revit environment, but most of our customers are still living in a in an AutoCAD world. That's where all of our tools are. So that's where that's where we live, and that's why this uh, my my portion of this of this demonstration uh, stays in AutoCAD. But I did pull all of the files uh, over into Revit as well, um, so all of the same application uh, flow would apply. So it took me uh, about uh, an hour and 15 minutes to develop the scans. I did scan across the room um, and collected them using the append feature on the DPI-7, which is, uh, which is a great tool for being able to collect space and, and move and collect uh, you know, this medium-sized room, as you saw. I was then able to push the, uh, the point cloud files out to PTX format. That took about 15 minutes. I pulled the files into the PTX files into the uh, ClearEdge Edgewise software on my PC back at my office, and they processed for about uh, 45 minutes uh, developing the pipe resolution. Um, I did have a manual pipe cleanup process uh, that did take me about an hour uh, to go through that process. I'm expecting with the information that Kevin just spoke about and the, and the uh, improved algorithms that, pr that number will go down. Um, but then I was able to export those, those pipes out of Edgewise and pull them into AutoCAD as the uh, background or the basis of my design. And that, that process took about 15 minutes. So I was able to actually get to my goal of basically having a four-hour uh, basis of design um, using these tools. So I was, I was actually pretty proud of that. Um, let's talk a little bit about some of the things that, uh, well, let's first, let me show you some of these, these pictures I have graphics. I, I, I think a lot of people are, um, 
they haven't seen some of these things in AutoCAD. So I took these screen captures and I wanted, and I actually, I left the, I could have gotten a bigger view of the of the model, but I wanted you to see the background uh, to, to show that this is truly in AutoCAD 2015. Um, you are able to pull these point clouds in. If you're using AutoCAD 2015, you can see actually right up there on the toolbar in the center, they actually have tools that are uh, made to facilitate the point clouds. Um, and so here is the same point cloud with the pipes resolved and brought in. Those are the edgewise pipes that came in right where they were supposed to once I uh, ran them through the cleaning process. And then the next slide will just show the uh, pipes by themselves as they are in AutoCAD. So if I had used a tape measure and, and maybe had, had gotten uh, some laser devices to actually line some of these things up, uh, and of course a, 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 a digital camera and maybe a, a tablet, uh, that's the way I would have done this in the past, it probably would have taken me 40 hours. I'm sure it would have taken multiple trips back to the job site to confirm things. Uh, that includes CAD time, driving time, and everything else. With this workflow, I was able to do it in a single trip and uh, I completed it in four hours, so that's a tremendous savings in time. And, and the quality of my end result is, is incomparable. Uh, I still have all that extra data of, of the information surrounding the equipment I'm working with. Um, some of the things that I learned through this, uh, again, the DPI, the, the dot product uh, scanner has a great append feature. So when you're working in spaces like this that are that are you know larger than just a single scan, you want to work with a either a star or a uh, spoken hub uh, type topology with your scans. You want to scan the middle of the room, and then you want to basically reach out and um, and append to a certain area. And you always want to refer back to that base scan. If you're referring all of your append scans to your base scan, you're going to minimize drift. Uh, drift is where you get the scans uh, not aligning perfectly. But as you could see from the quality of the scan that I got, the, uh, the, that process works very well. Um, the new features in DPI allow you to set the X, Y, and Z coordinates on the scan, on the base scan. And once you set it on the base scan when you're appending the others to it, uh, they'll all have that same coordinate. Um, when you're in Edgewise, I, I'll, I'll be honest with you, I, I had this expectation, I think, uh, that Edgewise was going to be doing um, creating the actual valves in a kind of in a photorealistic, uh, you know, rendition of, of what the pipes were, and, and it doesn't do that. But but what I really needed to understand was that I'm looking for the the accurate spatial and geomet geometric basis of the design, and it does that very very well and very fast. So. Once I got past that, I realized that I really just needed to get that into my AutoCAD model as a, as a basis of design. Um, those of you that are on the uh, webinar that, that do use our, some of our softwares, you're, feel, you're probably familiar with a, a command we use called Design Line. Design Line is something that will actually take a 3D polyline and, and completely fill it uh, per your specifications with whatever kind of service you have, be it a 6-inch black pipe or a, or a 12 by 24 inch piece of duck, whatever you want. So the next step I'm working on is is being able to just basically snap the design line to the center lines of these pipes that are found by Clear Edge, and that'll that'll be a, a another huge step. Um, the last key takeaway I want to mention here is that uh, as I have a, a lot of I have 20 years of design sitting behind a computer with headphones and drafting, and you know as a designer I have always dealt with that black void of space behind me. Um, of course, I never realized it until I got to, um, you know, into this scenario. But when you have the point cloud around you in AutoCAD, and then you can actually see what you're designing and what its relevance is to the space and the other equipment and things around it, it is a paradigm shift in how how you work. And, and I can see that, uh, you know, very soon in the, in the near future, designers are going to feel hampered that they don't have that background behind them and uh, and in a few years people people will not understand how we operated with that with that endless black void behind us all the time so uh, anyway that that's probably was was one of my biggest takeaways from all of this and that's all I've got um, so we look forward to questions and uh, Kevin if you want to take it away uh, I appreciate it and thank you again for the opportunity to present you bet, Jeffrey. Terrific uh, case study and great presentation. Really appreciate that. And uh, and I can tell we're going to have a lively uh, Q&A 
uh, because we're already getting a lot of questions, but we're right on schedule, so we're going to have uh, time to take a lot of questions right at the end, but uh, not quite yet because I'm going to uh, hand it over to uh, Sean Hescock right now, and he has actually another case study that he is going to uh, be talking about. Go ahead, Sean. Hi, uh, this is Sean Hescock. Uh, just real quick about me. Um, I, uh, I founded uh, Endeavor Rev 2013 or early in the year, and um, I, I come from an electrical design background and done a little bit of electrical design build. So my primary focus is the electrical side of, of BIM. Um, I, I've also done a substantial amount of Revit training, also a little bit of edgewise training. Uh, so I, I've, I founded Endeavor Rev around the basis that you know I, I enjoy the modeling and I, I really enjoy the training aspect of it. So we offer uh, you know just general BIM support, 3D modeling, 2D drafting. Uh, we do Revit project setup, lighting analysis for um, you know lighting calculations. We do Revit impl implementation, content creation, templates, that sort of thing. Um, I partnered with a local reseller here in Oregon, and we off we do their MEP uh, public classes. We 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 teach them, and then we're also just now, just recently, really getting into the scan to BIM. So that's that's, that's where I'm coming from. Uh, this particular project was kind of a kind of a different case. There's uh, the building is still in construction, so. Uh, we we had this circumstance where there's there's three major electrical rooms and we needed to get them all connected together because even while it's still in construction, it was all done in 2D. There was no 3D to reference or to coordinate with, and the uh, electrical contractor was wanting to come in and prefab a, a a large amount of additional conduit going from one room to another, and in order to save time and make the prefab actually work properly, we we scanned it to, to bring in all that all that data. So it was a total of 250 square feet worth of electrical rooms. You know they were they were a pretty good distance of, apart, and we captured some intermittent spaces just so we could get all of the information that we need uh, that we needed. Again, none of it was in 2D or none of it was in 3D. It was all in 2D, and there was no as built really being tracked at, at, at the time that we were we were doing this. So here's another view of that same area, just you know a uh, different perspective on the point cloud. But for our client, they 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 wanted the point cloud for their own reference. And they also wanted some images, some eye candy, some rendering stuff like that. But the the ultimate goal was to get a 3D working Revit model so they could coordinate and build the prefab information. So what we were doing were was uh, modeling all the piping, the conduit, the supports, duct, getting everything that they needed to to route route their large conduit banks from from one location to the other. So we this was uh, also our first attempt at at using this particular workflow. We've used Edgewise and Revit together in the past, but this was the first time we had used the the DPI handheld scanner. Uh, we were really interested in using this just because, you know, the the flexibility of using this scanner versus the the tripod scanner. Um, so we 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 took about two hours to do this scan, walking around. We uh, similar to the last situation, it was all appending the scans together. So we had a total of eight scans to do the entire project. Um, one thing we noticed was that uh, the the handheld scanner does not really like planar surfaces, so that was one thing that we we had to do. One thing we had to do to help with that is to place targets along the planar surfaces, so it would help keep that tracking, and you know you wouldn't have to keep readjusting and reappending and all that. Um, so after you, you do the scan, you optimize the scans using the Phi 3D software, which is part of the tablet, and then you export those scans to a single PTX file after you know everything's been appended and, and whatnot. Um, from there, you use Edgewise to, to split the PTX, which wasn't, wasn't a huge time, time consumption 
because with the size of these, uh, the size of the exports from the scanners, the handheld scanners are actually substantially smaller than the big um, tripod scanners. So the, the process doesn't take nearly as long. Um, and then we we brought that we brought that PTX scan into Edgewise, but due to what we were trying to capture, which in this case was you know all the conduit, all the duct, there was a lot of small bore conduit, a lot of one inch, three quarter inch conduit that we were trying to capture, and unfortunately, we didn't spend enough time gathering enough points on those small bore conduits, so Edgewise was having a hard time finding those. But that's um, you know, that's kind of kind of understood that was kind of understood going into it just so we rather than using the automatic ex extraction we ended up using the manual extraction just to manually identify where the conduit was and which you know and pull pull that and then connect everything using the the typical really user friendly methods of cleaning up and um, connecting and applying standards and um, getting kind of what you see here this is just one particular room in the scan so from there again like I said we cleaned up we connected and then we actually for this case the uh, it was rather unfortunate but we used an old version of the DPI scanner software and uh, so we weren't able to set the XYZ coordinates with the, with the version that we were using but when we brought the scan into Edgewise, it was, it was not, it was not vertical the way that it was supposed to be, and that was just us not getting around to updating the software. So that was our own fault. Um, so what we had to do was actually delete all the conduits and elbows, or all the elbows off from the conduits, so that we could then bring it into Revit and rotate it accordingly. So from there, cleaned it all up, we deleted the elbows, and then we brought it into Revit. Um, this was more my area because I'm more the Revit guy. The, the, the one helping was more the scanning guy. So it was, it was really nice being able to bring those pipes already in, already aligned, ready to go inside of Revit. And then all I had to do was use the trim command to connect to the elbows and then resize some of the, some of the elbows the, the bend radiuses and whatnot, but it was it was a really clean and easy transition to go from point cloud to edgewise to Revit, and you know it turned it turned out to be pretty good. This is an unfinished image, but you can see you know it captured almost almost 25 conduits just coming out of this one junction box. These larger conduits coming up over here and their weird angles, and it it did a really good job of capturing all that information. Here's another here's another view of that just to kind of get a better idea. We had to manually model the uh, junction box right here, the the panels down below. But most of this stuff, even this weird conduit that's kind of coming off on on the side, that was all pulled out of pulled out of edgewise, and it it was like I said, it was a fairly seamless transition. So typically. Going back, I, I was measuring this against the old, you know, the, the tripod scanner because that's what that's what we, I had more experience with, and so even from that, even using the large scanner, we we ended up saving quite a bit of time because the 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 registration process with the, with the the DPI scanner is much faster. Uh, with with the big tripod scanners, you got to you have to register it and bring it all together and you know stitch stitch the whole point cloud into one one uh, large file and it can be very time consuming. The nice thing about the, the the DPI scanner is that it will do it while you're scanning. It it stitches it all together, you append it, you know, that appended scan is already stitched to where it needs to be. So all said and done, we we ended up saving, you know, quite a bit of time using using this even over the big tripod scanners. So things that we learned was uh, make sure the software is up to date. Like, like I said, the, the scan came in kind of sideways, so we, we ended up losing some of the automated features just by, just by having to delete the, the fittings because Revit doesn't like to rotate fittings very well. Um, another thing that we noticed 
that would have been helpful for us to do is to capture both the floor and the ceiling in the same scan. We had a couple of areas where the ceiling was in one scan, the floor was in the other one, and it, and it caused a little bit of confusion for us. So it would, it would have been helpful to have those both together. Uh, the setup time with the DPI was, was a lot quicker just because you don't have to set up the, the scanner. You know, there's a little bit of waiting for it to warm up or whatnot, but we, we did notice it was, it was a pretty good time savings with this versus the, the tripod scanner. Um, as I said earlier, the DPI scanner, the registration is much faster just because it's, it's registering as you're scanning, which is great. Um, there, there were a couple of instances where we had talked about the tripod scanner might have been a little easier, especially for the, the large electrical room. What well, was it was a garage that had a had a switch gear in the corner, so that area would have been a lot easier with a tripod scanner. But then tracking tracking those conduits up along along the ceiling and into the other rooms, and you know getting the information that we needed. Uh, the, the the DPI scanner was was much better at that. It follows conduit very well. Follows any rough surfaces. It tracks along. It it'll capture the information. And whereas the big tri tripod scanner likes the 2D, you know, the, or the not 2D, the the planar surfaces, the walls and floors. The DPI scanner doesn't. Um, but on the other side, the large scanners don't really like the rough, the conduits, the you know, all the all the round surfaces. But the DPI scanner does. So it's, you know, it's definitely got its merits when you're using it for our particular application. Um, and again, just because of the small bore, the, the small size of the, of the conduits that we were trying to pull out, the manual extraction ended up being a little more accurate for us. Um, but the, uh, the larger stuff, there was a, there's a, a lot of pipe, some ductwork, that stuff we, we, you know, the automatic extraction would have been a lot better in those cases. Um, I guess I've already covered this, but the DPI-7 does not like the planar surfaces, so we had to use, we had to place tar targets. Unfortunately, there's none in the image, but for any, you know, vertical walls, flat surfaces that we were trying to span across to get additional information and keep everything together, we had to place a series of uh, targets so that, you know, there was a good differential between you know, the, the different areas, and it was able to, to track the scan a lot better that way. And I'll give that back to you, Kevin. All right, terrific, Sean. Appreciate that. And uh, we are right on schedule, and uh, that means it's time for Q&A. And again, for those of you who haven't already submitted a question, um, we simply ask that you type your question into the uh, question box, which you should find in the lower right-hand corner of your screens. And as I noted earlier, we've got uh, quite a few. So I'm going to ask our panelists to go ahead, turn their mics back on, and uh, just remind the, uh, the audience, we've got uh, Greg Laws, uh, Jeffrey McDonald, Sean Hescock, uh, Kevin Williams, and uh, joining us, uh, although he didn't speak earlier, is Tom Greaves uh, from Dot Products. So they're all available to take your questions. And as I said, we've got several, and I'm going to get us started here with the first one. All right. Um, let's see. Tom, I think I'm going to send this one to you. Um, this person says, uh, asking a question about the new, the new scanner. So this is not a laser scanner. What technology exactly is it using? Someone mentioned gaming sensor. What is that? So, Tom, can you enlighten people on, uh, on that one? Sure. The, the sensor that we use um, is a, called a structured light sensor. So there's a projector on, on, on the face of it that sends out a pattern of infrared dots. And these dots are detected by uh, a sensor on the, on the camera. And uh, the sensor can determine uh, the angle, two angles, the azimuth and zenith angle, to a specific patch of dots that are emitted by the projector. And when we have two angles and, a, and a, the distance between the uh, transmitter and the receiver, um, that gives us enough to do the trigonometry to calculate the depth measurement. So we get an infrared uh, depth measurement, 
uh, structured light infrared depth measurement. We married that depth measurement to uh, an RGB uh, camera uh, signal. So then we assign a depth value to each pixel in the RGB image. And then our software stitches together these depth mapped RGB images to, uh, to create a colored point cloud and, and to do a 3D reconstruction. Um, the thing to bear in mind about a structured light sensor um, that operates in the near infrared is that it does not perform well in direct sunlight. Uh, we can scan outside, but um, only when it's overcast or under, uh, you know, uh, under a, a protection from direct sunlight. Um, but uh, you know, it's it's targeted at indoor use. Um, can be used outdoors when it's uh, shielded from the direct sunlight or when the sun is low in the horizon, uh, end of day, beginning of day. Okay, and, and let me follow up on that. So is that technology better just for a portable type handheld um, device? Um, and I'm talking about the structured light uh, sensor technology as opposed to what's used in the more traditional terrestrial laser scanners? Well, structured light is uh, certainly used in handheld devices. We're not the only uh, organization that uses it, um, uh, and certainly structured light is also used in some static uh, scanners. It does have some range limitations also. Um, our device is the working range uh, for the DPI-7 is uh, 2, to, 2 to 11 or 2 to 12 feet. Um, we have another model that works from uh, about a foot to 6 feet, but, uh, you know, typically structured light devices are are limited in their range. Gotcha. And, and actually limitations is the uh, topic of the next question that came through, Tom, and that is um, uh, how long can you record or, or capture data before it uh, stops and you have to go to another uh, device? What is a little different about our device is the way it collects and processes the data. So where we could put our uh, scanner on a tripod and hold it fixed and train it on an area of interest and start collecting, um, we can leave it there for half an hour or an hour. Eventually, it, you know, after a few seconds, it stops collecting new information. The software is smart enough to figure that out, and it doesn't just keep blindly recording. It's saying, hey, I'm not getting any new information, so stop filling up the disk. So it's not so much a function of time, how long we can go, but uh, how many square feet of surface area that we can cover that is the uh, limiting factor. Uh, another way of looking at this is we can collect typically of order of 15 to 20 million points. Um, sometimes that takes a few minutes. Sometimes that can take tens of minutes. Um, it, it really is a function of how dense and complex the scene is that we're looking at. Um, the more detail, the more geometric variation the more color or texture variation in the scene, um, then uh, the, the more quickly we fill up the, 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 the memory. Um, okay. Tom, this is Jeffrey. I'd, I'd like to add that, that I started with the full battery on the sample that I showed of that medium-sized mechanical room, and I had just a little less than half of my battery left on mine at the time, if that gives you any sense of scale. Another way of looking at this is that we get about two and a half uh, hours, two and a half to three hours of continuous use. Um, one of the things that constrains the size of the point cloud that we can collect is the RAM on the tablet. So our first generation tablets had one gigabyte of RAM. About half of that was eaten up by uh, the operating system and the application, and uh, the other half was available for uh, point cloud payload. Uh, recently, we've moved to a two gigabyte RAM tablet. Uh, the NVIDIA Shield, and that has effectively tripled our capacity. Um, we're also a little smarter about memory management. Um, four gigabyte tablets are just around the horizon. Uh, we've got some working prototypes. Uh, we're working closely with all of the tablet manufacturers. The world of tablet computing is just exploding right now in capacity. And uh, so the limitations that we uh, endure today um, are going to be solved problems uh, tomorrow. Um, the tool is very workable today. There's no need to wait, but uh, it's going to get better, too. Okay, great. And uh, 
I'm going to throw the next question over to Greg. This is about, uh, we've had actually two questions come in on the output. Um, is the output of the scan a solid point cloud? And if not, is there a registration process where multiple scans need to be stitched together? Okay, there's several questions actually in that or several answers to that question. Um, the output is a point cloud. And if I start to capture, pan around, we collect our scenes, the data is being registered, if you will, in real time. Frame to frame, the system is doing an alignment. After you finish capture and you, it saves it to disk, there's a follow-up step that optimizes and tightens up that frame registration. You have the ability to append. So I can take a shot, and then I can decide I need a little bit more, find a good append point in the scene, and we can either append and continue, or I can append it and create a new file. As far as registration, orienting this to coordinate systems, in the version that is coming out of the dot product app software application, you have the ability on tablet to pick services and define your coordinate system, X, Y, and Z. And I can also pick points and define an origin point or a coordinate point. So if I'm shooting a mechanical room and I know the coordinate of a pump base, then I can orient my scan to that and have it drop right in where it needs to be. There are also target options that allow you to register your dot product if you had overlapping targets that were from a tripod scan. I could align my dot product scan to the tripod scan if I had the same coordinate system and it would drop in in the right location. I hope that answers the question. Yeah. I think so, and, and also somebody asked how accurate is the data acquired by the uh, by the uh, the new uh, the new device. The accuracy ranges from approximately, and I'm going to let the Tom clarify this, but up close when you're within a half a meter, we tell people it's approximately plus or minus a couple millimeters if you're capturing data that's at the far end of the range of the instrument, then the accuracy goes down to plus or minus uh, approximately 10 millimeters. But I'll let Tom explain the official way that, date, that accuracy is characterized. Yeah, so let me weigh in on that. Um, the accuracy or resolution of the device is range dependent. So the closer you are, uh, the, the better the resolution and the more accurate. And that, that's, um, that's true of other measuring devices too, uh, you know, including tripod scanners. But um, the sweet spot is uh, a couple of, Greg got the numbers right. Let me, let me answer it slightly differently and say the sweet spot of operation is from three to six feet for our device. If you can stay within that range, you get data that is, um, comparable to uh, a tripod laser scanner. Uh, you know, it's in that uh, three, four, five uh, millimeter uh, range. Okay. All right. That sounds good. And um, we have uh, a few questions for Kevin Williams uh, also. Um, will the new version of Edgewise have the ability to extract flat iron in structure mode? Flat iron. Um, I, depending on what the, what's meant by that, yes or no, probably not. Um, the that there there are steel plates that I believe is what the question is directed at. Um, like often you get connecting plates between pieces of steel, um, and that is that is on our roadmap for for a future release. But that is that will not be available in the 460 release. Okay. And uh, what does your attribution process look like to add intelligence to the model? Okay. In all of our models, we have a, a smart sheet behind them. Um, and it's, a, it's, it's basically, it looks and functions a lot like a spreadsheet. And you can, um, there, 
there are different attributes that are associated with steel and different attributes that are associated with pipes and same thing with ducts um, and you can the, depending on what those attributes are you can you can choose from a drop down list you can type it in etc um, so you can for instance set the the standard that you're using for a particular pipe to be ASME you can choose the pressure rating um, etc you can change the different valve types you can change the the, the elbow types etc um, through that smart sheet application so it's really pretty pretty quick and easy to, to change them it's it's probably similar if if you've used Revit um, it's it's a similar type of thing where you in Revit you've got a properties dialog um, that allows you to change things we've got a, a spreadsheet um, and it's so it's actually a little bit more functional it allows you to sort there's pros and cons but the, it's 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 quick and easy to update those attributes okay all right great and uh, let me uh, let me send this one to Jeffrey um, this somebody just asked you know how long did it take you to learn uh, to learn the new uh, the new uh, device the dot product that's a great question. Um, so I had the device and I was able to play with it uh, at the house uh, practicing different scans and, and th there is a bit of an art form to it. It doesn't take long. Um, the, the fact that the fact that you turn it on and it does to go through a warm-up period but once it's warmed up you just click and start scanning. What, what you have to learn or really it's really I would say it's really more becoming accustomed to is is understanding how fast you can move with the scanner and um, the screen actually has a great feature that uh, on the earlier version you if you were moving too fast or if you did not have enough um, what they call visual um, interest um, basically enough information for the scanner to keep track of where it is uh, in relationship from one point to the next it would you would just lose tracking and the new feature you actually get a little bit of a, a reddish glow around the outside of the screen and it's warning you that you're either moving too fast or that you're in an area where um, you need to move slower just generally because there isn't enough uh, visual interest information for it to maintain its its ongoing efforts to register on the fly so it's it's doing a tremendous amount of calculating so it really likes to do um, to see a lot of stuff, you know. Originally, I would I would treat scanning an area as if uh, the same way I would when I would go in and want to take pictures of a space. So I would be cleaning everything up, and I'd make sure all of the random stuff in the room was clean, and the desktop was clean, and and you know everything out of the room was clean. And it's quite the opposite with scanning. You, you want the the dot product wants to see things, and the more stuff and variation that's there, the better. So I love going into a room that's just filled with things and you scan away, you can move very quickly, you get great scans as long as you can get the corners of rooms and the important points that, that are, are the, the dimensional things that you're looking for. Again, developing that space, basis of design, you will become very adept at going into recap and cleaning things up. So, um, and so in other words, and because you're scanning so quickly now um, and it's you just move a lot faster um, so the answer to your question is I would say you could become adept at it at scanning and being in recap and getting a file that was prepped to go into AutoCAD in 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 less than a day um, okay. learning how to scan is probably going to take you an hour uh, you're going to have to scan uh, for a while to to just become a little bit more skilled at the pace at which you can scan um, but but that's that that's going to be probably you know a week at the most. Sure, sure. Sean, uh, you're obviously uh, an early user of the new device as well. Uh, do you have anything to add to that? Um, no, not really. He pretty much hit it right on right on the nose. I mean, the the biggest thing was just to to kind of get the flow, the motion down, in order to to not lose the tracking. Um, but you know, it was. I opened it up. I had another guy there, kind of with me. He had already played with it. He had already messed around with it. And then I was able to kind of pick it up. And after a little bit of instructions, you know, yeah, I, I felt pretty comfortable with it after those after those two hours. But again, I was also getting kind of instructions from somebody who had already used it. So it it's not a hard product to use, and it's it's pretty it's really user friendly. 
Okay, great. And uh, we're, we're going to go a little bit over time today because we have so many questions still queued up. Um, the next one, uh, we've actually had about three or four different versions of this question. I'm going to uh, ask Kevin Williams to uh, take it first, but maybe other people will want to uh, uh, add their two cents as well. And that's the, the question of whether the DPI-7, um, the, whether the scans you get from it can be combined, stitched together, et cetera, with um, scans from other uh, types of, say, more tr uh, traditional terrestrial uh, laser scanners? And if so, where do you do such uh, integration of data? Kevin? Well, um, I'm actually going to pass that off to, to somebody else. I have personally not, not done that. I, I, I know it's very possible. Um, it, it's not done in edgewise is the only comment I'll make on that. So okay. um, either Tom, Tom or Greg might be better qualified to answer that one. All right. Tom, you want to take so a shot at that? Jump. Go ahead. Go ahead, Greg. This, this, is, this is Greg, and just um, we talked a few minutes ago about the use of on-tablet coordinate system setup, so that if you do your dot product scan, and perhaps you have a Z and F scan, you can align the coordinate systems the same way, picking surfaces aligned to X and Y, picking a coordinate location, and when you export your dot product scan will be in the same coordinate space as your Z and F or your Leica scan, and you then should be able to pass that over to ClearEdge and have it in one contiguous world, if you will. Let, let me uh, right. add to that as well. There are you know, several processes for registering uh, dot product scans to uh, tripod scans. One is um, setting the coordinate system, as Greg described, on the tablet and, and lining it up that way. Uh, there's another workflow that we have using survey control. So if you have uh, checkerboard targets in the scene from the uh, tripod work, um, you can, on the tablet, enter those cord ta uh, target coordinates and rotate and translate the tablet data into the coordinate system of the uh, survey control file. Um, a third method that we're developing, um, uh, this is more to where the technology is headed, is that what we've done in our labs and with several of our partners is taken tripod captured data, uh, written it out in our uh, file format, which is very compressed by the way, a, a big file for us is 20, 20 megabytes. We take that file from the tripod scanner out of the bubble view, carve out a patch of it, and append to it. And when we do that, we're in the coordinate system of the uh, of the tripod scanner. So that's where we're headed with this uh, to make that very easy and robust to be able to move to, to be able to stitch together tripod data with uh, handheld data. And of course, the great advantage is that with the handheld, you can get the shadowed or occluded or backside of areas that. Uh, are not practical to reach, at least in a finite amount of time, with a tripod scanner. Okay. Good, and if good you answer. want to try that feature out today and now that Tom just talked about that's going to be implemented, systems like Leica, Cyclone, LFM, Scene that do cloud-to-cloud -cloud registration, you can cloud register a DP scan that's close to an existing tripod scan and get it right on. Okay, great. And Tom, real quick one for you. Does the DPI-7 work in dark areas? So we can get depth measurements in dark areas, but to do the tracking effectively, we really lean on having the RGB camera. So what I've been doing recently is attaching an onboard light uh, to the device. It's got a diffuser on it, and uh, it illuminates the area. Uh, these lights are, are modestly priced, um, and uh, so we bring our own light with us, and this has been very useful in uh, spaces like above ceiling, where you've got ceiling tiles, you pop a few tiles, it's dark up there, uh, we can reach in there with the light. Um, so let, let me cut to the chase, recommend having adequate lighting, the kind of lighting that you would require for taking a, a digital photograph, you know, it doesn't need to be, bla you know, really, really bright, but it does need to be adequate. And okay. uh, either you bring that, either you have that light or you bring it with LEDs or you uh, attach an LED. Uh, one of our partners, Panoscan, has made the point gun 
with a fully integrated onboard light, and, and that works like a charm, too. Okay, great. And, Sean, one uh, quick one for you. Did you notice any extra noise in your scans using the DPI-7? Yeah, there was a little bit more noise when you got to the longer, longer distances. Um, you know, if, if we were tracking tracking the pipes right along the wall that we were standing next to, you know, it was it was really clean, really really easy to follow inside of Revit and and the point cl or and edgewise. Um, you know, when we were standing on the floor looking up to the ceiling, it was, you know, a 13 foot ceiling, it was it was a little harder to. Um, you know, read exactly what was going on in the point cloud just be just because of the extra noise, like they were talking about earlier. So, it was it was a limitation of the distance from where we were standing versus you know where the actual pipes were that we were tracking. Let me weigh in on that too. There is a range filter that you can set in the software to filter points beyond just you you just don't collect them in the data beyond a certain range, and so if you have adequate geometry for tracking, you could filter, say, all points farther away than uh, 6 feet or 8 feet or 10 feet, and it just okay. won't, won't write them to the storage. All right, great. And, and uh, I'm going to give Kevin Williams the last word here. Uh, will the new release of Edgewise have the ability to layer or separate data? Uh, I would like to be able to process an area and then send it out for others to work on in Revit to keep multiple employees working on a single project. Kevin? Yeah, there there are a a couple of ways to do that with uh if you have Edgewise Plant, or if you've got the combination of Plant and if you have our full suite. Um, so particularly in the in the piping world, the, the the pipes can be split out by by layer, recombined afterwards, um, and that all of that functionality already exists. It will be. Enhanced um, in in some of the future future versions, particularly for steel, um, but uh, I, we're not going to have additional functionality for that in the 4.6 release coming out shortly. Um, that that will that will wait till the till the next release. Okay, great. Well, I think that's going to be it for us, Kevin. We're uh, pretty much out of time. Actually, we're over time. And uh, on behalf of our panelists and our sponsors, Workflow 4.0 and ClearEdge 3D. Let me thank all of our attendees for joining us today. And a reminder, uh, you will be receiving an email after the broadcast with a link to the recording. There will be a chance to subscribe to the newsletter and other follow-up information. And we hope to see you again for our next webinar. Thanks for joining us.